Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Vocast. I'm your host, Ethan Drew. Today, we've got a special guest with us. It's going to be Mr. David Michael Frank, the man with three last names. Say hello <laughs> to everybody. <laughs> How's it going? Yes. Uh, yeah, the three names thing is always a problem, but it's fine. If I'm at a doctor's office and they're just like, Michael, I'm like, okay, yeah, you meant David. It's good. Um, <laughs> hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Guys, for those of you that don't know who he is, he is a musin, musician and singer of many talents. He has fa- grown his... In- I cannot speak today. It is a tradition here at the channel for me to stumble on my words at the very beginning of a video. It's all right. If you do not know who DMF is, you have to go check out his TikTok. He has gained a respectable following of 2.2 million followers. Does that sound right? Mm-hmm. And All right. if you've not heard him yet, I'm going to play a couple of examples of his work on screen right now. Boom. Yeah, so if you're not already familiar, you're about to be. He's a really cool individual. We're going to learn more about him today and his journey in music. So if you guys are enjoying the content, make sure you hit a like. Drop a comment down below. Even if it's just a smiley face, it helps with the algorithm. And it helps me be able to bring more singers' interviews to you here on the channel. Without further ado, guys, David, you ready to jump into this, man? I'm ready. Let's go. All right, so keeping it very light as the first question of the podcast, what is your favorite or preferred drink? My, are, and are we still talking in relation to vocal stuff here? Or you're just talking in general. Just in general. Just in general. Just in general. Um, honestly, the, so the vocal stuff does sort of uh, take over my life a little bit. So uh, we'll just... I'll just give you, it's either a very nice bourbon, which is not super vocal heavy, although it does help a little, mm-hmm. or uh, it would be um, throat coat tea, fresh ginger, honey, lemon. I never know if you say turmeric, turmeric. Turmeric? Uh, I don't really know. <laughs> turmeric. Um, let's see what else I throw in there. I got some CBD I'll usually throw in. Uh, God, there's so much that goes into my vocal tea, but I actually love it. And uh, yeah. Have you noticed okay. um, any particular healing factors or anything significant about the use of CBD oil in the in your vocal tea? Wow. Okay. Um, so, gosh. Uh, I actually had some vocal problems a few years ago, and that was when um, my voice doctor told me that actually everything looks fine, but I, like, still couldn't sing. And so then mm. I... Um, she had suggested CBD, THC products, um, and I, you know, it's sort of the stress uh, and what it can do to sort of muscles going on here. So from an anti-inflammatory perspective and also sort of like the de-stressing element of it, yeah, I do I do really like CBD okay. um, Sweet. as a part of it. Yeah. Man, though, that's finding success in uh, vocal tea. I didn't know that that would even work. That's pretty awesome to know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I happen to have a bunch of extra CBD because I, I you'll learn in this podcast I am crazy, um, so I basically started a CBD company as well amongst all the other things I do. But uh, I never launched it, so I have eight different products with different like beautiful designs. I don't have any on my desk right now, and so I've just been eating into my stash until it's like the right time to launch this CBD company. Um, so yeah, I have a ton of CBD. Yeah, that's awesome. And hey, if it's got medical benefit and it's benefiting you, then who who would be anyone be to question, right? 
Yeah, it's just that I like sat on the the inventory for so long that now it looks just it's just ridiculous. But that's fine. <laughs> um, there is a lot of inventory of CBD products, but I'm just eating all of them. <laughs> uh, Might as well, you know. And I yeah. guess it works out best in your experience or in your situation. Yeah, I get to test it. You know, <clears throat> it's always so like expensive or whatever to normally test it. And, mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyways. No so, doubt. yes, my vocal drink would be uh, my, like, super crazy tea. Yeah. I, I've never really gotten too heavy into the vocal tea, so I never really knew how beneficial they could actually be. Um, the, you know where you, the teas, as far as tea goes, throat coat is just the best. Um, but where okay. you'll be really surprised, and I wonder if, I wonder, you know, I should have pulled it for this podcast. Aha! Oh man! Oh man! Oh, I told you I'm crazy. I told you. I told you. Oh, I do have one of my CBDs here. I, I think you're gonna like this. And isn't that cute? And oh, that's cool. Straight up my company, and I like never launched it. All right. So you want to know something crazy about vocal stuff? Let's hear it. There's these products out there. Vocal Ease. There's a bunch of them. There's Entertainer Secret. They do what a lot of the teas do, which is they have the the good ingredients. And it's not hard to find what the good ingredients are. But these are so... It, it's going to be like honey, echinacea, ginger root, okay. uh, osha root, licorice root, propolis. Um, it's going to be these roots. And the thing is, is this spray bottle they sell at like Guitar Center online. It'll be like $30 for this little thing. Yeah. And... It's just aloe vera juice with the tiniest bit of, like, the good stuff. And then they sell it for $30, and it's just sugar water. It tastes like sugar water. So one of the things that I did was I realized that they were scamming us. Mm -hmm. um, And I went and I invested in the actual propolis extract and literally every single one of the... One of the things, oh, this is a horseradish root. Here's what? slippery elm extract. And so then I go and I make my own, this is like my vocal drawer. I just got off tour, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I go and I make my own vocal extract that's way better than this sugar crap that they have. That's the pure stuff. And then I you know, use my own spray bottles and spray it into my mouth and my face. And it saves me when I'm on tour and on stage. <laughs> and uh, the answer is, are the teas um helpful yeah but if you can find what's good in the tea and then just buy the extracts and make them for yourself um yeah so yeah like i said i'm completely insane i'm sorry (laughs) (laughs) full-on mad scientist but what what does it take to save a few extra bucks on something right yeah and it's like so much better of a product like it it's night and day like when you try the sugar water versus mine and you like try mine you'll be like wow like i can my voice feels good. It feels awesome. Um, mm-hmm. It's super helpful and a lot of anti-inflammatory stuff as well. Um, yeah, that, That's even better. That's awesome. Bit of a tangent, but that is really cool information. Yeah. Sorry. Total nope. tangent. <laughs> this, If you've seen any of my podcasts in the past, you know that we get off on tangents on a regular basis. So that's, it's no harm, no foul. <laughs> All right, good. Well, I'm about to throw you for a whirl here because you got the <laughs> guest of guests. <laughs> Let's... Let's dive into our first official question that's probably going to open up a can of worms. Uh, what or who got you into music? Okay, not bad, not bad. Easy question. Um, you know, I my dad, music was really important to him, and he, you know, just sort of grew up as like a hippie, and, um, you know, it could be classic rock, Eric Clapton, Led Zeppelin, whatever it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I somewhere in there started to enjoy music and was going to shows with my parents and it was the home both of them and so i yeah i fell in love with music at a young age and i grew up in seattle where the youth music scene was incredible so i was like 12 playing shows with like 15 16 17 year olds and like working my way up in that in that community with all these like awesome venues and a lot of the bands have done insane things. Like one of the bands that I used to play with, they're now Portugal the Man. Um, but so many bands were hugely successful and uh, got record deals and fell off or whatever. And so, yeah, I fell in love with music through my dad sharing it with me. But okay. then uh, being in bands, I learned 
guitar, bass, and drums, and started recording on a four-track cassette recorder, and then I had a 12, 12 track CD burner thing, and we were like writing songs about the cute girls in class, and like, <laughs> yeah, all of the stuff, all of the stuff from such a young age, and being in the Seattle scene growing up was um, just awesome. Did you have a specific instrument that you gravitated to the most? Um, guitar and drums. Um, but guitar is my first instrument and my main instrument. Um, yeah, other than yeah. I guess you'd say vocals now, but, uh, I was always the lead guitar player. I didn't have the confidence, uh, as a singer and I always had singers in my bands and I eventually mm -hmm. had some confidence, but, uh, I, I got really lucky. Um, my guitar teacher w was in the rock and roll hall of fame for, uh, being in a band called Heart. So if you've heard Barracuda or Crazy on Yes. Um, Are you serious? I just got lucky. It was that his son was in my class and so like he was also taught my soccer my soccer team or whatever. But but yeah, so I had like a rock and roll Hall of Famer as my guitar teacher. Wow. And so I uh I had just a lot of stuff that was taught to me from a young age about recording and playing well and you know, not editing everything and yeah, it was it was awesome. That's that's already something really cool to find out. You literally had Hart's guitar player who's in the guitar all, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. That is huge. And I imagine, when did you realize that that was the case? Like, when did you realize, man, this dude is actually legendary? I mean, we all knew. I mean, he was the... We knew. He, my friend we had, knew. like, this rock star dad. Um and yeah it was just i mean he wasn't in the band anymore i think he was kicked out in the 80s like mid 80s or whatever okay, but he yeah. did write barracuda and magic man and crazy on you and all of those yeah. mega hits um and so he would teach them to me um but yeah i we knew about it and you know he would take us snowboarding and stuff and it was he yeah we were just it was just sort of luck but um it still instilled a lot into my my music knowledge at a young age that was helpful yeah absolutely just checking my time here. Sweet. So um, this is a, a bit of a two-part question. So the, the other part of the question is, how or about when did you figure out you could sing? When, when did you build that confidence, more specifically in your circumstance? So if you go way back at the very beginning, um, I, I was, like I said, a, a child sort of playing guitar and backing someone up. And I started to learn to harmonize a little, but I was pretty weak. And um, the egos of sort of like my lead singer not wanting me to sing as much, whatever it was, which, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of developed over time as well, too. Um, and then uh, I think for my senior project in high school, I was like, I'm going to learn all the instruments and I'm going to record at a real studio. And yeah. so that was when I started studying voice. Um, and, you know, I joined some like, vocal thing i started singing like some like standards musical theatery things and just sort of got to learn a little bit of it um and i was in bands and then when i went to college i studied vocal performance as well as business so gotcha. um i was going to the music school and i was also going to the business school um and you know music was everything i was always doing i was in all my bands and i uh just was singing to serve the song and that was always the most important thing was what is the song and i'm a songwriter and i'm we're putting out this music and i'm producing it and the singing was nothing more than that um and over time uh multiple bands i was i started youtube i got if, you, if you, you'll maybe ask about all the things but i got put into like a boy band and and whatever eventually it took a turn from treating singing as just the the way to get the song out there to well covid happened and then tiktok mm -hmm. and i started posting and i realized pretty quickly that the things that would do the best were the hardest vocal passages mm -hmm. and so what happened was this shift of like Okay, so like I've always been a slightly higher singer, but there's singers I'm jealous of that I can't do, and I always get really tired on tour, and um, yeah. it, you know there was all these things, and then all of a sudden I I started training my voice on basically on TikTok because every day I was waking up and I was like, all right, I'm gonna make a new video today, and what am I gonna sing? And I would think of the hardest thing I could think of. I'd be like, oh, this song was really cool. Steve Perry sounded great here. Like, 
Yeah. Whatever it whatever it was. And so and I got annoyed seeing other people make their TikToks and uh pre recording them and like <laughs> and like because they would everybody still does it. They would fake mm-hmm. it, then they would pre record it, they'd edit it, and then they would lip sync to it. And mm-hmm. I would see the breath mismatch from a mile away and I hated it. Yeah. And so I was like, all right, I'm gonna do all my TikToks live, which was a nightmare. Especially yeah. because in LA my <laughs> studio would get so hot as soon as I turn off the AC. Oh no. So, <laughs> yeah, so in all my videos, you are truly seeing one hundred percent of my singing skill. I realized what was going viral was the things that I liked sang well on. So yeah. I just started pushing myself and every single day I'm like bursting at the seams. I had mm-hmm. good technique from years of you know, vocal performance studying and singing Italian tenor in college, whatever. Mm -hmm. But I was still pushing it like an athlete would push their training. So now you had this like daily regimen of like 100% of what I can do on live on my TikTok. And then that just escalated to a point that I was like, all right, so like what if I were to train my voice like an athlete training for the Olympics? What if I were to just physically like train it so that I could be the best that I could ever be at my peak of like physical whatever um and so i sort of took this shift away from like the song being everything which is still ingrained in me right and i just i I just worked on my voice for hours every day the tough stuff like if something was difficult for me i would focus on that um and so now my voice sort of unlocked this thing where i can sing celine dion in her key and uh, evanescence and, and like heart I, I, yeah. I have gotten it to the point that there's not really things that I any singer that's like this, the hardest ones I like find it a fun thing to challenge um, and so now it's sort of like you have this machine that can this car that can go 120 on the freeway or whatever and now uh, <clears throat> taking a step back from that and going back to the most important thing which is serving the song but now there's sort of more um range that you can throw into the emotional depth of a song yeah and it's just purely because i like invested in the time to only focus on my singing which made my guitar playing worse and my drumming worse and my producing and all my other skills but for that like year or two it was only just pedal to the metal on singing skill yeah, and I've noticed that too, and I did a small deep dive on his content, and I can confirm, as as a singer myself and as a learning producer, his stuff is legit, <laughs> without a doubt. So, Thank you. Um, for those that, like I said, like I said in the beginning, if you don't know who he is, go listen to his stuff. Impressive. Impressive feats of singing and vocal range, all that, all the stuffs. So, Thank you. Now you've officially learned where it came from. <laughs> yeah, just, I, I mean, I, yeah, I credit a lot of TikTok, and then there were other people that were sort of, uh, like, inspiring me in my peer group that, that were people that were singing this incredible stuff. And so I was like, wow, like, that's so cool. I want to do that. And there's, like, still things on my, like, list of, there's always things on my list of what to, what to sing and, and um, what to learn how to sing. Yeah. Because it's not it's not like you can just sing anything easily the first time. I'm like doing a show this week that's random that I was invited to do like a Taylor Swift showcase yeah. and I'm seeing blank space and I like just didn't think anything of it. I was like, Yeah, it's gonna be easy. It's so hard as a guy to <laughs> sing blank space. She's up there the entire time and I have to like really focus like on my technique to like be able to pop between falsetto full voice and like everything that makes it hard to sing as a as a guy singing in her register right Um, and and i mean i'm also not coming at it from this place of like sort of like egotistical cockiness or anything like i i am my own worst enemy as far as my own uh like insecurities Uh, i like can't listen to my voice when i hear it back like um, yeah me too it's you're not alone like yeah, any confidence that came out of me saying, like, I can do things that are sweet, like, I do know I can do things that are sweet, but that doesn't still mean I can nail it, and that doesn't mean that I'm, like, some cocky, confident guy. I'm my worst Simon Cowell to myself all the time yep. that has done me well to this point, but, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's fun to be hard on yourself. It makes you better, but, but it's, it's hard. 
the never-ending pursuit of perfection, despite knowing we'll never quite fully get there, right? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I'm starting to try to come to terms with the fact that we might not ever fully get there. Um, no, that's all right. But that's, I guess, that is a benefit of being hard on yourself in a way. Is that you never truly satisfied with the way you sound? Because I guess it's a bit of a double-edged sword, right? Yeah, yeah, no, it's um, it's tough. And then even beyond that, the the instrument is you, and so that creates this like. If someone's judging your singing, they're actually sort of judging you, which is where all that insecurity comes from as a child mm-hmm. when you're like too scared to sing in front of someone. But when you really understand it, it's it's that you're the thing resonating. And right. honestly, if you're stressed and you're not allowing yourself to resonate like somebody barely hitting a drum or like lightly strumming a guitar, it's this cycle of like you're stressed, but then you don't sing well because you can't resonate. And then you get judged, but they're not just judging your singing. They're actually judging you because it's your heart and it's your emotions and it's your real thing. But you can't get there because you're stressed and it's this horrible cycle. So you sort of have to get over it, which is why I said singing tea and a little bit of nice bourbon. (laughs) (laughs) Some external forces can make a difference sometimes, right? (laughs) It's true. It's true. Just a little. On to our next question on our list. Um, who are some of the more influential figures both in your life as well as your musical career? Cool. Um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a tough question. Um, I, I touched on it earlier. I think my, my peers, the people that I, I see out there doing great things on, on socials and their own music, uh, I think that is sort of my, my biggest inspiration. Um, and it's from a from a celebration of other people having success with their their dreams and and where they want to be and what they're pursuing. Um, so I I really get inspired by that. Um, and I and I see a lot of like weird jealousies out in the industry too. And so I try to also like not have that. And of course it's easy to compare yourself. Sure. Um, but I I truly do come from a place of just so excited when I see the success. Um, and then. Um, I mean, it's, you know, I, I have, I have two kids. I have a, an Asher is, is about to be three this month and Violet is seven months old. So I'm inspired by them purely out of the fact that they're these like little genetic versions of, of me and my wife that, that they're just absorbing everything and Asher's crazy musical um, and so I, I want to, I want to be best for them. I want to play, uh, big shows for them. I want to show them somebody who is fighting for their dreams relentlessly and not necessarily where I want to be. I could quit anytime. I could go get a job. I could do all of those things, but, um, I've chosen a difficult career that hasn't come easily to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm nowhere where I need to be and I've had countless setbacks and I, I am, it's a very, very lonely and tough life. But when somebody tells you that your music saved their life, all of a sudden that value is is so much more real than it is from the bank account of the Spotify or whatever, right? It adds um, all that weight. It adds so much more weight and gravity to what you're doing. Yeah, it's uh, you, like if somebody tattoos your lyrics, like, and they tell you this that you made them feel less alone. Like that value is like it. it so much in the gas tank of someone who's like i feeling isolated or pushed out from the industry or like things aren't happening the way you want or whatever it is like i could just quit and go get a job like all this but but in reality like it's those it's those people that the music has touched um and it could be a voice it could be a video it could be a smile and a joke or whatever it is but like that impact you never know um which is why i'm so addicted to this so you know, I, I'm inspired to, to share that with, with my, my kids. Um, and then beyond my peers and my kids, I think, I think the, uh, I think just the greatest musicians that I can, I have had the opportunity to study. I, I've had a lot of, um, of, a uh, groundwork through my artistry because I spent a lot of time making covers because yeah. it would make, get new eyeballs and, um, it's not the things I'm the most proud of because they're not my music. They're they're me doing this to get attention. 
Right. But at the same time, I'm studying like the best songs and the best singers and I'm re-recording their stuff and I'm interpreting their stuff. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm incredibly inspired by the greatest, you know, artists in the world or sometimes the, just the ones that put out a catchy pop song that I'm trying to cover. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's sort of my, my inspiration. Do you have any immediate peers that you would like to um, give a quick shout out that you would say has inspired you in the recent history? Um, honestly, I, I think that the first thing that came to my mind is actually the, the crew I just had on my tour, which I know that's not the question you're looking for. You're looking for like who else in social media is doing cool things and, there's a lot of those people, and I and I I'll take I, whatever you give me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I and I see them, and they're friends of mine, and everybody's doing great stuff. And I know I had an opportunity to blow some smoke up some people's butts, um, but <laughs> but I I actually find that also the the gratitude at sort of the the earlier unjaded un you know things aren't just working out like in people's favor like whatever the unlucky whatever the the people that had to do the the grunt work with me on my tour inspire me because i might be a little bit more uh fearful i've signed bad record deals i might be a little bit more jaded from the idea of like definitely trust um sure but yeah. but also like I have to rationalize why I haven't had some Justin Bieber 17-year-old success and I've had years taken out every time a band member screws us and changes the passwords and then producers and one of our four managers like tries to put cease and desist letters on us and we are in tough spots like um mm -hmm. so anyways I brought out a crew and I had um two young I had 19-year-old Berkeley College of Music students backing me up musically um, and they took on all the driving. And I had a tour manager who also is in the trenches. And she did Warp Tour multiple times in a bus in the summer. I've done, I've slept in my van in the summer with wooden bunk beds. Like, I appreciate that grind. So yeah. um, I think the answer to the question of, like, who in my peer group is is inspiring me, I actually think it's the other people that I can find around me that are saying i'm not crazy or that are saying um like keep going but at the same time they're sweating just as hard as i am and, and i'm sweating just as hard as they are and that sort of like innocence of being 18 19 and just thinking that the world is this easy music thing is is so naive it's not easy and right. then to have that musical magical innocence and then i can afford to take them on the road and in a rv and give them bunks and, and food and water and pay them well competitively. Um, and then them say things like just so grateful that they're even driving long hours. But at the same time, like we're all on the hustle for this thing. Um, so I think it's when I see the, when I see the people that haven't lost the, what makes it tick for why they fell in love with music in the first place. Um, and it's something that I strive to do, and it's something that um, it's hard to see necessarily in my peers and their success until I'm in a van with them on tour. But I can speak to the people that I was just around, having having heart um, and having the the passion. So yeah, Alice, Ben, Gabe, and Dave um, were all people that that have that thing, and they haven't lost it. Some are younger than others. Some have been through more or less hardship than others but um yeah willing to put in the time and work that it takes to to hopefully get lucky enough to to make the career really work um yeah yeah absolutely and at at the end of the day the question is what ins who inspires you it doesn't really matter at the end of the day who but if you see the people around you putting in that drive and heart it's inspiring in itself to see them making happen what you stand for and them standing with, for it with you. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's cool to be inspired, um, by the people around you. I think that's, um, it's special. 
For sure. And um, I do have a follow-up question to that one. Um, what is something that one of these influential figures has said to you that stuck with you? Oh man, um, uh, the when I was before music, before music, I I I wanted to be a professional basketball player. Um, granted, I was a child, right? And I'm also not very tall, so uh, it just didn't um, it didn't go anywhere. I had good like good ball handling skills, and like I was like a good shot, and you know I'd get the assists. But eventually, everybody else grew, and I didn't matter how fast I was, I couldn't get get around them. Um, <laughs> but like it's sort of like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame guitar teacher. I had like the Seattle Supersonics like scouting coach that like went to my mom's gym or whatever, and they like went out to dinner with him. Mm -hmm. um and uh and yeah it was it, i think i think sort of the quote was just sort of like you gotta you gotta let the boy live his dream <laughs> and um i don't know they've always quoted that granted i think they did try to meddle a little on my dreams but that's fine um <laughs> and they still do um but 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 i i have sort of always uh lived with that um that sort of like the dreamer element of of um pursuing that and and like i said you can i could have quit and i still could quit at any point in time but um yeah you don't know what the pathway it's going to be but if you can sort of stay true to that so yeah you gotta let the boy live his dream let the boy live his dream yeah and those of you that are dreamers you end up getting the most done it seems <laughs> yeah hopefully <laughs> uh, sometimes i think i'm just spinning my wheels but but i'm you know i'm uh no, I am. I am really uh, fortunate and and passionate about what I do, and um, I do recognize that there are people that absolutely hate their jobs. And mm -hmm. while my job is truly twenty four hours, and if I come upstairs and I talk about music with my wife, she's like, "You're can you you leave the work at some point in time?" I'm like, "But it's not work. It's music. I love the music. Uh, right. If I had millions of dollars, I would still be doing the same thing." Um, but um, you know, it. I I am at a place that I can sort of make my own hours and I can do what I want. Um, uh, but it, at any point in time, it can sort of all fall apart and all go away from you. So right. um, it is also this anxiety that you have to maintain um, the relevance and and be consistent. And I I know I've been inconsistent for the last year and a half um, because I'm working on like a crazy double album. But uh, it's all in the in the game and in the pursuit, um, short term, long term. And what do I want to do? What do I want to be? And the short term covers or whatever are fun, but if I'm going to need to put in the time to make something that's really really special, um, it does take me away from making all the viral videos all the time. We'll get back <laughs> yeah. to it. Well, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it's a big project too, right? So, yeah, I have 25 songs that are uh, about to be done. 25 and how long did it take you to get through this i started in january of last year so yeah okay. but in that time we also had another baby and i've planned to completely cr if you think my vocal spray is crazy it's nothing <laughs> compared to the tours that i just did the tours are not normal at all no one's ever done anything like it and i've done two of them as well as this uh 25 song double album that's like i see the light at the end of the tunnel so yeah. you, I've heard you call it the Devil Album. Is there any particular like assigned reason why you call it that? <laughs> well, I just think like I've been calling it an, the album, but the problem is, is, is an album's like sort of ten-ish songs, and I have okay, twenty-five, yeah. <laughs> um, and I couldn't like I couldn't whittle it down anymore. And I probably I know I started writing one the other day, so it might be a month more. And I also <laughs> recognize where we are from a marketing standpoint. Yeah. Um, I mean, this whole thing, from the tour I just did to what I intend to do with the, the release strategy, I, I think people aren't thinking this way. So that's why I have so much like preparation. I'm like in the background just like doing this for a long time, <laughs> just getting ready to swing. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm excited. It, it probably will come out in batches of albums, yes, but it, not originally. It, yeah. se it does definitely seem like a daunting... Low, big task, if you will, to release a 25-song 
album, so to speak, or I guess you could say maybe even a mega album if we were to venture into that vocabulary. But that's especially imagine. just imagine. Take one, take <laughs> take one song, take one song, and you you're gonna write it. That could be a few hours, or it could be something that you wrestle with. For weeks, it could be something that keeps you up at night, right? Yep. So let's just throw a day or two or whatever, a few days into writing this song. But I play every instrument. Um, and so you build out the arrangement. You, you then record the basic scratch crappy tracks. And all of these things take so much time and there's a lot of editing. And then you write the drum parts and you record the drum parts and you edit the drum parts. And then you write the bass part, and you record it, and you edit, and every single one of these, and I'm not saying it's just one guitar, because you mm -hmm. end up having to layer like 40 different guitars and all of these keyboard parts. Every single thing has to get time-aligned and quantized and, and comped and tuned. Every note, every, every time a drummer hand goes up and down, that is another click on the 16 microphones that goes... So, for every one of those songs, you're truly looking at 150 hours, 200 hours, maybe more, mm -hmm. times 27, 25, uh, plus all of the other things that have been going on in my life. And yeah, you have a project that is um, insane to, to totally understand. This is why bands take years to do albums. And it's easier if you were outsourcing it to a bunch of different people and producers. But if I'm the only person for the most part that's like, Touching it, that's a lot. Yeah, it is. And when you start outsourcing things at that kind of scale, you start talking some pretty big bucks. Too. Yeah, and I do. And I already, I'm already far over budget because, yeah, you send something to someone that's a better keyboard player and say, hey, put whatever you want. I trust you. I don't know what else it needs. I think I've done pretty good, but what do you got? And when you give people freedom, they come up with the coolest stuff. I know, and then they, they send you like an invoice for whatever, 300, 400 bucks. And you're like, sweet, that's awesome. But you start doing that multiple times on multiple songs. And then you get to like mastering. I paid for mastering from the number one guy in the industry, uh, Ted Jensen. He's done everything from Green Day, American Idiot to like any of the new Taylor Swift versions. He's the number one person that you can get. And he yeah. doesn't even work with everyone. And I... And I hit him up, and he agreed to work with me, and then I paid his fee on one song, and I had already had that song be mastered by other people, but I heard the master, and I was like, oh, no. I have to pay this fee on every one of the 25 songs because it's insane what it does to the tonality of the song. I, he can make things louder and brighter and clearer and bassier than everyone else. I don't know why. He's cheating. I don't know what it is. <laughs> but then... I. Uh, now I have to hire the best mastering engineer in the world, and I don't have a major record label budget. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> he's so good, though. I have to. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot of work, and it's something I will be very, very proud of whenever I can release it. But I'm not going to put it out as one big thing and sort of ruin the marketing behind it. i gotta, I got to play 2024 with it. Oh, absolutely. And it, it now makes sense why you've assigned that label to, to the whole project. <laughs> yeah, I might even call it a triple eventually because, like, it's just gonna be. I'm gonna play. I'll, I, I am happy to share marketing, but I, uh, it's gonna be singles for a minute, um, based on what I can get to go on fire. But I'm not gonna be teasing anything until it's all done. Yeah, for sure. So, so as is the way of marketing in the music industry, it's a tough one. It's for a sure. Tough one. So. Going to revisiting instruments for a minute. So you mentioned guitar, drums, bass. Are there any other noteworthy instruments that you play? Yeah, I mean, I I play keys. I I yes. I hurt my my piano skills because I'm a producer, and I did something that I would suggest no one ever do. Was that I learned as a producer that you could just transpose everything into C, and then <laughs> your keyboard can play an E by pressing plus four. So I'm really good in C now. <laughs> um, but if you, if you, uh, put me in, you're like, yo, this song's an E flat. I'm gonna be like, but it's a piano. I can't play a real piano. I need to like transpose it. What do you mean? I can't, I, um, yeah. So I did hurt myself there, but also whatever. It doesn't matter. It's fine. Hey, whatever works. Yeah. It's... Yeah. I shouldn't have done that. That's bad. <laughs> you give your, Hey, if you, if you don't follow your own advice, at least you learn from it. Right. 
Yeah. Yeah, I still have time in my life to, like, learn piano correctly. But for now, I'll just play and see. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that at the end of the day. I mean, it may be it may be a slap on the wrist moment, but... Yeah. Yeah. So, that's a pretty wide range... Well, that may be a, a somewhat small scope, so to speak, of instruments to play, but it those are some very complicated instruments to... Play, and I can confirm that having a guitar back here, I have a set of keys in the other room. I've got a trombone over here, which is a funny instrument to have on off to the side. So, I mean, these are all like instruments that, while it may be a small scope of them, they are actually incredibly. I'm trying to think of the word. They are very. You can do a wide range of things with them. Sure, and it's hard to sort of become an expert at something, and then especially in the world of recording, to mm -hmm. be able to do it uh, well, proficiently, to, to, yeah, to be able to record a, an instrument, to be able to play drums well enough to record is not easy. No. And you can replace things or whatever, but, like, you can hear it. And so, like, go listen to my records, and you're going to hear, like, those like everything that you're hearing for the most part you might be hearing a tambourine know that that was me being like, like yeah exactly <laughs> uh, like it's not as and i hate when people are like i'll play triangle triangle live and you're like can you really play triangle because like that's not that easy okay it's, it's not, not that easy <laughs> you just need to learn what angles to hit it from how hard to hit it and it gets surprisingly scientific Sure, and then like you gotta, yeah, you gotta play well. You can't just—it's not easy to record tambourine. It's not. Go no. record tambourine. Like you actually have to like play it well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, um, I do have something. This one's gonna be off the beaten path a little bit, but this will um, kind of freshen up the flow. What are some What are some random facts that people may not know about you in your online or music life? Random facts that people might not know about me. Now, I've had my fair share of interviews in my time. There's not much that I haven't, uh, like, shared. I feel like I'm, a, I'm an open book. Um, you know, and if you see me online, I look like a golden retriever of just, like, <laughs> happiness and silliness. Um, but uh, I've definitely shared this story, but this is, this is good. I don't know how controversial we... It's not even controversial. Anyways... Uh, when you're a touring musician, I get a lot of questions that are like, "Hey, uh, do you have do you have any tattoos?" And and the answer to that is always, "Well, no, I don't, but I I do have a branding on my butt <laughs> of my school notebook. Um, <laughs> it was a it was a summer school thing, and we got drunk, and it was my birthday, and I threw the a notebook into the fire and there was like a spiral coil that was just staring us in the face and I don't really handle getting like uh, dared to do anything like very well so I was dared to to do that and I I uh you know I I I'm not going to be a pussy about it so yeah I pulled my pants down and and this uh this little girl she wanted to be the one and she was also the most weirdly religious too which is like interesting she's like I'm going to brand his ass we're like whoa there like, okay are you okay Caitlin she's like, it's mine I'm like okay all right that's fine you can do it um and uh <laughs> a little little blonde girl and she uh she yeah she she did it she branded my butt so I've got this like stupid curly cue of like my spiral notebook and it's it i if you ask me which side of my butt it's on i couldn't tell you you know you're plugging a usb at 50 50 chance like it's this side or this side i don't know 50 50 it might be this one i'm not really sure um but the funny thing about it was um i was around that fire pit with a bunch of my friends and it was my birthday and so uh the dares continued and like Five of my friends also have like a stupid curly cue from my summer school notebook on their butts. <laughs> Mine's the only one that's like still there. There's all, you know, faded away. Yeah. I took the brunt of the heat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is, that's, that is a heck of a story. <laughs> it's good. It's a good one. It's a good one. No tattoos, but I got a branding on my butt. And it's not too far off of a tattoo anyway. They're both brandings in some form or fashion, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, that's just sort of a, 
is sort of silly. But yeah, that's a good story. That is a good story. What are some things that you do in your off time when you're not do when you're not involved in music, touring, recording, etc.? What does that even mean? Um, it's no, a good question. I, <laughs> yeah, no, I am so obsessed with music, but uh, yeah, I don't I don't do anything else. Um, no, well now I'm I'm a dad, um, and so that that is a thing. Uh, you know, hanging out with them. Uh, it's not. It sort of sucks being a dad. Uh, <laughs> sounds like a horrible sentence. It sucks being a dad when the kids are very young. And I'm not going to say, like, you know, women have their own. It's way harder. They do birth, and it's a lot, okay? That's fine. I'm just going to speak as a dad for a second. Yeah. We don't get as much oxytocin bonding at the young ages. We're not, like, uh, breastfeeding. Uh, mm -hmm. So we. it's harder to connect um, with the the little version of us that, you know, mom is so bonded to from like a evolutionary breastfeeding, like just so bonded. Right. Um, and so as they get older, then like the personalities come out and then like, now you don't get their little hand. That's like, who are you? And they flip you off. You're like, go away. I want mom. You're like, you're like <laughs> I mean, that's not what she says. She can't say words, but it, it feels like the little finger. Um, and, uh, yeah, then you then you sort of hit this age where they like realize, oh, dad, J oh, nice to meet you, dad. You're like, I've been here for the last year and a half. What the <laughs> hell? Um, then it just gets better, um, and then they're funny and they do cool shit. So that's it's really awesome having Asher, um, like really just sort of get it and like learn so much. Um, yeah. Violet still doesn't know my name, of course, but we'll get no, it's it's fine. We're getting there. We're getting there. Um, and so, yeah, being a dad, but then the other thing that I love as much as music, which sucks because I moved to Nashville, yeah. is snowboarding. It sounds stupid that it's snowboarding, but, like, I started skiing at two years old, too, and that's the way my family bonds. And then in high school and junior high, I went to two different ski buses on Wednesday and Saturday. And then in college, I taught snowboarding outside on the weekends. And then... I moved to L.A., and L.A. was sweet because you could still go snowboarding, and Big Bear is so awesome. Mm -hmm. And then I now moved to Nashville, and I am it's the worst. I can't snowboard. There's no snow around here. I have to, no choice, but I'm going to have to fly somewhere. But I got young kids, and so I have to be home as much as I can be. And so all I really can do is just raise Asher so that he is going to be my friend, that as soon as he's old enough, I can be like, all right, cool, we're going to Whistler. I'm taking Asher to Whistler. I will see you later. <laughs> we're good. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, the whole snowboarding thing does suck that I can't do that here. I will yeah. add, uh, add something to that. Um, one state over in North Carolina where I'm from, if I recall correctly, there is a place to snowboard here. I just don't recall exactly where it is, so I will have to research that and get back to you. There are some things. There are I I'm familiar. I've I've only done West Virginia and Pennsylvania. Um Okay, okay. But those are they're hills. They're totally hills. It doesn't count as a mountain. Yeah. And that's okay. I can still deal with it. Um but it's just hard to, to be able to get the time and go away and i don't really have any mm -hmm. friends here that that snowboard um and yeah i could go to north carolina but even then like it'll be a tiny hill and i'll have to like either like bring the whole family um true yeah or i like or but i can get asher old enough he'll be good he snowboarded a little bit every year a little bit and oh i'm sure so, yeah yeah i figured that the the any snowboarding or skiing that's over here is probably tiny compared to what you're used to and it's so it's actually interestingly different so when i went in pennsylvania um i was the only snowboarder and it was all older skiers and i was getting looked at in a judgmental way like oh this snowboarder and i was like what year is it, is it 1991 <laughs> what the hell is going on because like the west coast is all snowboarders and they're like oh yeah. you're on our path like what what is going on yeah, it was weird. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> but that's what? awesome, though. Like, skiing and snowboarding. I've not heard that one on the podcast yet. 
Yeah. Well, they used to. They had beef with each other. They thought snowboarders were like rambunctious little air, eh. and so like they did hate each other in the nineties. But like, it was just weird. Pennsylvania was like way behind the times. <laughs> Get off our hill! I'm like, what the hell? What's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> There's they're a hateful <laughs> bunch, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. Strange. <laughs> hey, but snowboarding and skiing, so I've never been I've always wanted to give it a shot, despite how dangerous it seems. I was a certified snowboard instructor and I am a teacher if I was another job and I use my teaching skills all the time. You have free snowboard lessons for me. Uh, if we ever get an opportunity and I will go in two seconds. If you're like, let's go, I will I will meet you. <laughs> In Denver, <laughs> let's go right now. I will give you snowboard lessons for a little bit. I'll get you started, and I will leave. You can go. Then when you get tired, you can go have a nice, warm, hot toddy or like a peppermint mocha, hot chocolate, Bailey's thing or whatever. <laughs> and then I will rip it for a while, and then I'll come back and be like, how are you doing? And then I'll like give you some more like lessons on the magic carpet. And I'll be like, that's so awesome. I'll be like, I'm going to be out of here. I'll see you. Oh, you go have some more drinks, and then it'll be great. We will do laps. I will do laps, and you'll that go is, up the carpet a few times. That is but awesome. I'll teach you. I can get you good. I could get you good. I am, I am a good teacher for it, but it'll still take you a few days. I will have to um, put a pin in that and might have to reach out at some point then. I'm, I will go anytime. Let's go to Denver. Let's go to Vail. Let's go, I, well, anytime. Let's go. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Back, steering back to uh, music and singing for just a little bit here, um, mm -hmm. how often do you practice singing throughout the week, and about how long do you t spend practicing? It depends. Um, I, I'm i very busy with the things that I that I do, so I, I got taken away for the tour planning for a few months before the tour because it's such a unique tour. Um, I also have a lot of... I have a lot of allergies and I have a and I have a toddler and he just gets me sick and it's this horrible <laughs> cycle of like I'm like trying to stay away from him and he's got like a booger and I'm like oh no we're screwed <laughs> and then like and then he'll start to get better and then I'll get sick and then it's just over and over again it happened for it happens for months every year yeah. and I just got home from tour and like I had not I had not been able to really sing before tour for a few months because I was dealing with getting sick from him and then I got home, and I was sick immediately. And I literally just started singing again like two or three days ago. Um, and I'm still, like, sick. But it does help me, I feel like, push it through. Um, but, yeah, it's just sort of when I can get through the sickness stuff because of the toddler. Um, but on a, on a perfect, like, on, like, maybe, like, a regular world... Um, I try to build it into my daily routine as far as like working out and starting to to warm up my voice. I sing um a ton through through little straws. Oh um, yes. Yeah, that's I mean I probably take it to like extremes. <laughs> like I'm like <laughs> they're like, whoa, okay, like <laughs> you shouldn't be doing that with your straw. <laughs> I'm serious though. That's how you that's the secret. <laughs> that's OVTs, man. Yeah, no, it's good. It, you know what's ridiculous is all the people also selling the hundred dollar straws out there. I'm gonna start selling my own hundred dollar straws here pretty soon. Um, this straw is way better than all the other bull straws out there. I swear to God, it's 120, but it comes with a bag. You get a case, you get a case and a bag. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, that's so valuable. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm happy to keep talking singing stuff. I'm like such a nerd about vocal <laughs> like speech pathology. I have I have videos and pictures on my phone of my vocal cords back to 2011. Um I have seen so I have the best voice doctor in the world. I'm going to give her a shout out. Uh Rena Gupta, voice doctor. Is it just voice the voice doctor on Instagram or voice doctor L <laughs> Everyone from Halsey to uh, Sean Mendez um, wow. to Alec Benjamin. Um, yeah, she's the best. Um, but uh, I know my vocal stuff pretty deeply, um, which, is, which is cool. That is agreed. Okay, let's see. So um, if you will drop a quick uh, elevator pitch, so to speak of some of your personal favorite artists that you've collaborated with. 
collaborated with. If there's um, if there's any that come to mind. Sure. Um collaborated with uh I had I I'm sort of from like an old school generation of YouTube where um all of the people that that were sort of getting in and and playing all the instruments or producing it out and building it up um I never blew up in that world but I always was a part of it and then I also was a one-stop shop as far as like producing all of their content um so I also had opportunities to collaborate with a lot of these like big dogs on YouTube who I was looking up to that eventually ended up becoming great friends and I started touring with a lot of them and um so I I do sort of think about all of the fr- all of my friends from you know Tiffany Albert or Kurt Hugo Schneider and Tyler Ward and Alex Goot and um there there were just so many that I was working with and producing when I was living in LA and um that were so important in my sort of formative years as a as a musician um and they were inspiring the the crap out of me um and then from from there I mean there hasn't been that many collaborations other than of course like being on tour and like singing with other artists and yeah. touring with other artists um yeah, there's been there's been some awesome awesome people. Um, I guess one that I'd like to give a shout out to was uh, a band I had on my tour last tour um, called Burn the Jukebox, and they're young, they're very young, and they're super talented, and their their families are all involved and super supportive, and um, they play their instruments incredibly well, and they're going to be very successful, especially if they really keep this up and stay as humble um, and kind. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I I get to I get to collaborate with people all the time. That's sort of the beauty also in TikTok is you can sort of duet stuff, and it's sort of like you uh, collaborating. Yeah, and I, that's something that I personally do on occasion, and I've always enjoyed it, and I love that functionality and the ability to do that. So I really think that collaborating not only – I think it's a much more capable – we have more possibilities there now than there have ever been. Yeah. Yeah, anybody that you want to work with, you can do at their stuff, and usually it's pretty easy to get in touch with anybody. It's usually always their name at gmail.com. Even the famous people that you meet that, like, eventually give you their email in, like, L.A. or whatever, and you're like, oh, it's just your name at gmail? Like, (laughs) I'm sure Justin Timberlake is Justin Timberlake at gmail. Like, that's what it is. Yeah, David Michael Frank at gmail. Like, everyone's name at gmail is just probably their email. Assure you. That's a really good uh, note for myself because sometimes I try to figure out the best way to reach out to some of my future podcast guests. So that's a good note for me. There you go. I'm telling you, it's just going to be like, see ya at Gmail. And like, that'll be it. Like, see ya, would you come on the podcast? She'll be like, wow, I can't believe you guessed it. You win. Like, yeah, that's it. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Lady Gaga at Gmail. <laughs> All right, so let's see. We have one more question we're going to do, and then we'll give a quick break. Um, Do you have any quick tips, tricks, or life hacks for anyone that wants to sing or is trying to make a career out of singing? Cool. Um, Oh, man, there's so many different things. Uh, I started thinking, like, fundamentals. Uh, um, Actually, I'm going to go back to the if you're just getting started. I mentioned something about your confidence um that is sort of the thing that everybody has to get over because you yourself are the instrument and if you can let yourself resonate then you will sing better and that uh singing can be a sort of a frictionless or that's definitely the wrong word but can be uh easy and can be smooth and to do that you're gonna have to relax and you're gonna have to have the confidence um even if you're making that confidence up even if you suck you have to just know that you are going to throw that note out there no matter what because if you don't you, it's not coming out it will not happen right and eventually that confidence is what you when you know you can hit the note you're going to go you're going to throw it out there but if you can just start throwing it out there even when you totally suck then you've at least figured out the hardest part which is the confidence yeah i can guarantee you that is one of the harder parts and especially with my I guess what you could say, I guess they've assigned a name to it, imposter syndrome. Sure. Yeah. But yeah, can confirm <laughs> if you can get past that. I get great vocalists in my studio and then I'll be coaching them on what to do or a part or whatever. 
and then I'll and then I'll be like sing this thing and then they'll be like I can't hit that I'll be like yeah you can't hit that and I promise you I will get singers doing their highest notes and again I was a teacher so I like it's a little manipulative in the ways in which I can like trick someone to do the thing but I know that they can do the thing and it's just a confidence thing it's yeah. that's all it is yeah I have found that out in my adventures for sure all right yeah. so very quick divider break here in questions f from me to you so what this little period of time is is for an, a point of a point in the podcast for you to plug any merch talk about what's going on in your life and just kind of let us know what you got going on so you have the floor for the next couple minutes to kind of let us in on that all right well i'll take this time uh look my name is david michael frank three first names i know it's a thing but uh, I'm an artist that fell in love with music and the connection because I heard my music um, or I saw what my music was doing for people from the, the connection, from the lyrics and, and hearing their stories and fell in love with that journey and continue to push my artistry and continue to push for, for a dream, but also understanding the connection that the art can make um, and every single person that's watching and listening um, mattering rather than big views and numbers. You might see, I might have... Feel something, feel a little bit less alone or connected to some form of art. Um, and that sort of actually makes this more about you and I instead of someone putting out music or art to a mass. Um, and that, um, if you're interested in, in learning more about me, I'm a real person. I might look like a golden retriever online, but I'm, <laughs> I'm a real person. I live in Nashville, and, and uh, I'm chasing the dream just like you are, and I have tough things in my life just like you do, um, and I'm easy to get in touch with as well. Um, but uh, I, think my, I think, you know, if you want to be a part of something, um, check out my stuff on any of the music, but I encourage you to, to find something where I'm sharing my heart or my stories or who I am. Um, I have an awesome community on my Patreon. People get the merch because it actually like means a little bit more than just the merch. And they're also like supporting it and believing in something that hopefully is just bigger than the selfishness of, of someone going for it or whatever. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, check me out. I, I have a ton of things in the works. I've been quiet for a while I, because I'm working on, a ton of original music and I'm going to release it in a way that no one else has ever released music. And, um, I'm going to build my community out stronger. Um, as soon as I can stop just focusing on the art for a second and then bring it back to the, to the world and the connection with you. Um, so yeah, David Michael Frank. But if you find the other David Michael Frank, I hate him. I hate him. He is my arch enemy and arch nemesis. And, uh, yeah, look for me, not the other David Michael Frank. <laughs> Didn't know there was another one. Oh, don't get me started. He, uh... <laughs> oh. Give us an elevator switched... pitch. Oh, my God. I switched to my name. I've been in bands for a long time, and I was in a boy band, four guys, and we were signed, whatever, and then we became three guys, and we were doing great things, and then the drummer screwed us over and stole all of our Facebook passwords and wanted fifty thousand dollars or else we wouldn't get our passwords back, but his dad was mafia, so it didn't matter. And oh. we had death threats against us, so now three guys becomes two guys, but we couldn't keep the old band name because that guy sucked. And so now two guys were gonna take over the world, but then my guitar player fell in love with a Norwegian model. This is what happened in Panic at the Disco. And now, now Jose <laughs> needed to move to Norway to be with her. They broke up. But that's what happens to every band. So now I was the last remaining member of this band name, and I held onto the band name because I had shirts that said the name of the, the band, name of the band. And then eventually, just about two and a half years ago, maybe two years, whatever, I switched to David Michael Frank, um, and now I am a new artist despite all of that. Now, I had put out one song before all the bands under David Michael Frank. So when I switched, I kicked off the other David Michael Frank, who's like an 85-year-old, and he's like 80. He's like an 80-year-old uh, old music composer. And he had been releasing music on my Spotify for a while, and I should have not done this, but I kicked him off and said, ha, it's mine, I was here first. And then... Now he can still release music on my Spotify, and so he does. And I get an email that's like, your music's about to come out. And I email my distributor, and I go, help, stop, stop, stop. And they go, there's <laughs> nothing we could do until it comes out. And 
he puts out music on my Spotify. It's ruining my algorithm. And the album art of the things that he has put out are ridiculous. There's <laughs> David Michael Frank, like the, an the, the anthology or whatever, number three. He is an old old man at a piano and he has a naked woman lying in front of him on the piano but there's shadows that cover her but she is fully naked and the music is not good and my fans get a Spotify notification that he releases an album and then they either like look at it and click away and he ruins my algorithm or they listen to it and then they're like ew this is gross and then they leave and also the album art's offensive. That's um, crazy. <laughs> I know. He owns davidmichaelfrank.com as well. And a long time ago, I emailed him and asked, and I should have been more clear, but I did say when you're done with it. I did mean when you die. And I understand that's <laughs> crass, but I, he's old. And I, I meant, can I have davidmichaelfrank.com when you're done? And he said, no, I, I'll never be done with it. So I do have an alarm that goes off every time that website should renew and that keeps changing his credit card every time it expires. I'll never get davidmichaelfrank.com. That's unfortunate, man. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Not salty about it at all, but it's okay, right? Yeah. I'm going to tell you one more David Frank story. Go for I get it. phone calls. I get phone calls <clears throat> randomly, and it probably happens once every week. And I'll be like, what's this? And they'll be like, hey, so it, it could be a di – there's always a different tactic, but I can always tell pretty quickly. It's like, hey, so we were, like, talking last week. Well, you had met with Lori. I'm, I would love to talk with you about our products. And I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Are you looking for David Frank? And they go, yeah. I'm like, David Frank, the CFO of Aqua Bounty. They go, yes, the, that's the one. And I, go, <laughs> and I go, all right, here's the deal. Did you get my phone number? Uh, I, off, I'm, I'm not going to say the name of the website because I then uh, then people will go find my number. But yeah. uh, I know where you got my number. I'm not that David Michael Frank. I, I'm not that David Frank. I say, go over to TikTok, and I want you to look up David Michael Frank. And then they will. And they'll be like, wow, you, you have a lot of followers. I go, that's great. I have gotten every follower <laughs> from telling people that are trying to call David <laughs> Frank, the CFO of Aqua Bounty, to go and follow my TikTok. <laughs> and, and they always they always sort of warm up and then they're like that's cool but you don't know david frank i'm like no i don't but if you do get his number will you please give me his number so i can call him um yeah they like do some like salmon it's like a, they genetically modify salmon and everybody's trying to get this guy hired for his, their jobs or for the whatever Gosh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy other, uh, other david franks out there man Ugh. Man, you got to change your name again. No, I'm joking. Uh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. All right, so one more quick little section here, that, and, and then we'll hit you with a, la a quick slurry of questions. Um, brief section for you to ask me any questions, should you have any. Are you, uh, what's your vocal register? So I'm prim I primarily lie in the baritone range. Um, I have more of a desire so to speak to live in the lower the de the depths if you will um, okay like a bass yes that's where i like to sing that does not mean that's where my voice is supposed to sit so to speak can you do any like subharmonic stuff uh <clears throat> have you ever heard have you ever heard people do it it's crazy um the there's a, a friend of mine who's really big on all the socials named peyton parish peyton um, parish and he's, yeah, and he have you seen his stuff? Yes. Yeah, and so he's a baritone. And mm -hmm. um when he sings, um, and he's actually really <clears throat> incredibly talented. Um, when he sings and he sings low, he has another thing that he can go into that is this subharmonic bass thing. And he says he can't do it a lot, it'll tire him out. Um, and I believe it because he goes from like a low note and all of a sudden you hear it just like shift and it's like, boo, and it's like, does this crazy thing. And I think he had to learn it. Yes. 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 I think you tapped into it. Yeah. I, there. Yep. Uh, that's it. I can't do it. Um, but it's if you can so harness hard. that, it's so hard. If you can harness that, that would be, um, great. The problem with strengthening your low range is that. Your vocal cords are the length at which they are. So if you take if you take a guitar and you try to tune it, I'm not gonna show it. <laughs> if you try to tune it lower, mm -hmm. right, it's gonna get floppy. And if you try to sing it, tune it higher, 
it's going to run out of steam, right? So what right. I can do singing higher, and what you can do too, is I lower or I, I shorten the string length of my vocal cord. So I'm not actually vibrating the entire vocal cord when I'm singing super high. I'm actually taking the whole vocal cord and I'm folding it in on itself and I'm just vibrating a little bit. Yeah. Where uh, you're going to struggle is that your vocal cords are the length at which they are. So you mm -hmm. are sort of limited. So we're all, we're all limited with that. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot that you can do. The subharmonics tap into other stuff. Um, tone. There's a lot that you can sort of open up. Still. You can start diving into other techniques too, as well. Like something you can dive into inhal inhalation base. You can do chest fry base. You can get all kinds of crazy. Uh, yeah, I know. There's a lot. Um, how familiar? I mean, how familiar are you with uh, Bobby Waters? Uh, good friend. Um, he's, and he's, he's he awesome. Comes out to my show. I actually had him on. Uh, his very first show um was at my last tour um okay and, yeah uh yeah he's he's awesome and um yeah his voice is is wild yes totally wild. he he is one of the individuals that i have recently come to be good acquaintances with that i probably don't know that many people who are better at subharmonics than him he's very Ooh. very good at it yeah, he's he's super good at it. Um and kind and humble and um hard working and um very in the like uh like I said, I was like in music school but also business, but I like wasn't like that music schooly. He's like super music school. You can like tell certain mm -hmm. personalities and people are like more music schooly or whatever. So yeah. he's very music schooly, which is cool. I, I, I vibe with all of the you can tell when kids are like Broadway kids, you can tell like all the yeah. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, yeah, super, super, good, super cool, dude. Any other questions that stick out that you want to pitch my way before we move on? Are do you play anything, or are you an artist? What do you do with your singing? So primarily, what I do, since I struggle a little bit with that musical confidence, like I don't like listening to myself over and over, but I do like to do TikTok duets. I like to do stuff where I'm blending my voice in. I don't really do that many solo projects as of yet. Um, I plan to change that, but in the interim, I do, uh, I do the duets. Um, I don't play guitar on camera, but I do play. I do have the keyboard that I also play some from time to time off camera, as well as the trombone. That's an instrument that, for some odd reason, I just never stopped playing ever since high school, and cool. it's just fun. Yeah. But my primary cool. gig is singing over TikTok and through duets, etc. That's awesome. Yeah, I I think that's also like the best technique to grow is to f see other stuff that's out there that's already doing well, and if you know that you can add something something to it musically, that's like the best technique. And so I'll I'll favorite stuff all the time of, oh like like Haley Williams is going viral all the time right now, mm -hmm. um, and so I'm like oh I should do at this oh, I should and like I just haven't had time, but um yeah that's the that's awesome. Good for you. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to. I apologize that I haven't checked everything out, but I'm really excited to check out. No, I'm I'm really excited. I'm gonna follow you on all the things, and I I'm really excited to to check you out. Shoot yourself a uh, I'm on your <laughs> podcast. Give me you give me all of your socials and what's going on, huh? Okay, might as well. Um, look for Ethan Drew or Ethan Drew Music. You will find me on Instagram. I have approximately 115 followers right now, but that's something that I, I don't post regularly on Instagram. So that's one of those things where I just need to get better at it. Um, TikTok has been pretty sporadic here lately as well, but I am working on finding more content to do duets with. Um, I also did failed to mention that I do also like to beatbox and EQ beatbox. For some reason, that's just... I, I didn't think that I would have any... I would hold any water there, so to speak. I didn't think I was going to be that good at it, but I have had a lot of compliments lately, and I'm like, okay, maybe I should explore this a little more. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, that's that's awesome. I mean, I think definitely definitely keep that up. Um, I mean, it's sort of like a, a, a very niche skill, but, man, if you could find a way to bring that in, plus also you can sing low, so then you can do, like, the bass stuff while you're doing it. There's a lot there. Yeah, and I, I, I tend to really enjoy a cappella music, so that's part of the reason where I get my that's part of the place where i get the desire to beatbox from so i guess yeah. 
but yeah, that's that's pretty much all of my stuff in short. Um, TikTok, I have two thousand and thirty three followers. Just just so that way, it's it's an identifier to help you find me. Two thousand and thirty four. Two thousand and thirty four, my man. I appreciate you. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, that's cool. I used to do all of uh, a ton of the production for Peter Hollins. Do you know him? Yes, very familiar with him. He is a legend. Yeah, I I produced all of his wife's stuff for like probably like two years or something. And then yeah, I've worked with him for a long, long time. And he's a good old friend and um, super talented and and a machine of a businessman. And the way that they have been running their, you know how they do his channel and all of the businesses that they do and mm -hmm. um yeah that one is one that i've always dreamed of having on the podcast so i will one day have him make an appearance i don't know when but hopefully well you can clip this and you can say uh hi peter uh you should definitely be on the podcast um but no, it's been honestly awesome talking to you about vocals, and it's cool that you care so much about it. And yeah, Peter's great, and uh, an inspiration to so many people like yourself. Mm -hmm. And now you mentioned like, oh, you're you're building and beatboxing, whatever it is. And like, um, I think that there's sort of this freedom with learning all these parts of the voice, and someone like Peter, um, who's just been doing it for so long, sort of opened that up to so many people. I feel like um, absolutely. So yeah, you will have Peter on your podcast. Whether it just happens naturally or I say, hey, Peter, <laughs> podcast, he's a Drew. I'm working with, um, I've been conversing with um, a certain bass singer who won't be named, but it will be obvious who it is from a certain acapella country group, uh, <clears throat> Home Free. Nice. Um, I'm trying to work with him on getting him on, and I've got a couple of other people I'm trying to get. So more cool stuff coming down the road soon. Yeah, just keep it up. I mean, you know, you just have to be persistent, and then you have to, uh, um, yeah, just just keep it up. I, it's been an honor. I, I'm grateful that you had me on. It's also really cool to be able to talk about um, the vocal stuff, because when you take it seriously, um, it feels like this weird nerdy thing that not everyone really understands, and it's it's difficult, and it's, it's sensitive. It's mm -hmm. a very, very sensitive instrument. Um, and so we have to care about it very differently than a guitar player on tour that can go out and party and talk in a loud club. Like it just takes a different sensitivity. Um, and especially when you try to improve and get better with it. So, um, yeah, I think it's a cool, it's a great podcast idea. And yeah, I appreciate it. Um, we are running a little bit over on time, so I do have one more, or I'm going to skip a couple of these questions that I'd normally ask just for the sake of time, but you're not missing a whole lot. So, but we are going to finish off with the bang. Um, if you could steal a fellow singer's voice or any singer's voice, any singer's voice throughout time, alive or passed on, who would it be and why? Uh, man, that's tough. Um, there's a lot of people. I think, I think I'd go. It, it's tough because you, you. I have to put a year. I have to put years on it. Um, Steve Perry at his prime Ooh. is uh really incredible. And it's really hard to, um, it, I, a tenor has a certain age range that they're best. I do believe it's 35 to 55. Um, and so if you think about like an Olympic athlete or you can think about Mike Tyson fighting Logan or what or Jake Paul, like there's all of these things about sort of like your like athletic peak. And if you think about vocals like that, um, and the stuff that Steve Perry could do and was doing is so incredible and was so incredible um like there's those live recordings and i sing with them every day and so i study all these extra things i'm like he threw that in as like a random melody change <laughs> like i've learned it because i sing with it every day but like really like and and it's so hard and so talented and his tone was so good and there's no auto tune at the time yeah. um and uh yeah i think i would go with that um, 
it's a tough choice, of course, but um that was a really good choice to that question though, because I have no one, I haven't had it on the podcast yet, but two, Steve Perry's just a legendary tenor singer in general. Yeah. And I and I think it's also sort of important to to think about sort of that that peak. Um because that's something that we notice with athletes, right? You're like, oh, Michael Jordan's the best basketball player of all time, but like Michael Jordan, this is like you have to compare it, mm-hmm. um, and that also brings in sort of how people are like, oh, Robert Plant, why aren't you getting back together for Led Zeppelin? And like, I think he knows, like, he you can tune it down and you can do whatever, but he can't do what he could do, and so he doesn't want to put himself out like that, yeah. um, because just. Purely, you are at your athletic peak when you do the thing that's captured and recorded and put out forever. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, yeah, you hear people talk a lot of shit about like older people not being able to sing how they used to be. And to do what we do, it's actually very, very hard on a vocalist and an athlete. And if you don't use it, you lose it. Um, and, uh, yeah. People got to be nicer to the older singers that sound bad from time to time, okay? And any <laughs> singer sounding bad. Come on, we all have bad days. I have bad days all the time. So do I. Like, it, it's oh com- completely normal. Yeah, and, like, we're always held to this crazy standard, and I'm, like, sleeping in an RV on tour, and, like, <laughs> the window next to my head happens to, it has no insulation, and so I'm in, like, five-degree weather because we're in the winter in an RV, but the back room's got the heater in the other room, and they're all in a furnace and like i have to sing the next day like it's this it's so sensitive yeah for for singers it really is it is guys we are here at the end of the podcast david thank you so much for chilling out with us today i very much appreciate this uh opportunity thank you for allowing us to learn more about you and just no problem. thank you for appearing it's been a fantastic time um, ladies and gentlemen this has been Ethan Drew and the Vocast make sure you go check him out if you're not familiar with him and his music I've got, we'll have all of his stuff linked in the description below and make sure you drop a like drop a comment like I said at the very beginning helps with the algorithm subscribe with the bell turned on so that way you never miss another upload and until the next one this is Ethan Drew Love you. Take care of yourselves. We will see you in the next one. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in today. This video was made possible by wonderful patrons like Miss Nancy Flesher. If you're interested in getting audio shoutouts or video shoutouts at the end of my videos, make sure you hit the link in my description to go to Patreon where you have that ability. Thank you so much for watching again. I love you. Take care of yourselves and we'll see you soon.